Uh, yeah, um, now it works. So, um, <coughs> yeah, so, so thank you everybody who organized it and gave us a chance to reflect on Xu Cheng's legacy. Um, uh, this is a work which was done in collaboration with my colleague Rivas Ramazashvili from, um, from Toulouse, France. And um, I will sort of start by saying that I became Xu Cheng's graduate student in 95 and was there uh, from 95 to 2000. So when I came, uh, Xu Cheng already had a largely developed group. Uh, maybe it was uh, much larger later, but it was already kind of big. And um, he probably also had an idea to keep his connections with IBM. So I was outsourced uh, to work uh, at IBM as a graduate student. And uh, so that's why uh, due to Xu Cheng I had two advisors, and that's why I got to know a lot of nice uh, people in IBM. Uh, the, they were interested in Spintronics, and that's what I was uh, directed to. Uh, and their interest was, uh, as a company, was uh, a lot of, uh, had a lot of practical aspects. So what I will be talking about is um, a situation uh, where <coughs> there are a few exotic effects. I will talk about the situation when you have a conducting material where both electric and spin current are conducted by the itinerant electrons and uh, by thinking about those dots representing electric charge and those arrows that represent the direction of electric spin, uh, I will try to describe their behavior. So for example, this cartoon on the right is a representation of pure spin current where the number of electrons follow flowing to the left with spin up and to the right with spin down is equal, so the electric current is absent. Uh, so the materials I will talk about are simply normal metals and strong ferromagnets, uh, and there will be a little part about metals with spin orbit interactions li like platinum. Uh, this talk, uh, and I now want, wanted to, to, to thank the previous speaker, Joe Orenstein, for setting the tone for this conversation. I hope it to be a very light, uh, mm, much lighter than the previous one and entertaining because what it is is looking at the things which are known uh, from a little bit different angle. And sometimes when you do it, uh, things look unfamiliar and almost impossible and paradoxical. Uh, but when you resolve those riddles, uh, you understand that there was no paradox. Uh, the outcome is that you may have a better understanding of things you thought you know. So that, that was the case for me at least. Uh, <coughs> so we'll also talk about the diffusive regime of propagation of spin and charge current. So there is a uh, time of relaxation of momentum which is much, much smaller than the time of relaxation of spin. And consequently the mean free pass of an electron is much smaller than spin diffusion lengths which can be smaller or larger than the size of your device. Uh, we will Think about situation with spin accumulation. The left cartoon is no spin accumulation. Every electrons uh, are pair, all electrons are paired with spins in opposite directions. Here you have spin accumulation. So uh, the uh, state of the electrons in the conductor are that there is an inner Fermi surface which is filled doubly, and then there is a belt here which is filled in a single particle per state manner and the, all those particles are pointing with spins in the same direction. Uh, in terms of energy, that means that there are two levels, uh, one for spin up, ele well, spin electrons with direction in positive psi and negative psi. And the difference between those two levels, which is shown here, is the spin potential, which is proportional to spin accumulation. Uh, the average position of the spin potential is the electric voltage. Uh, we will talk about first. We will talk about two examples. The first example is a situation uh, that was pioneered in '85, very long time ago, by Johnson and Silsby. They had a normal metal line with two ferromagnets and two extra electrodes. They would inject electric current into this ferromagnet, and then the current would propagate back through the line and then go to the current source. 
uh, the right hand side of the device was electrically floating. So there was only one uh, connection point of this right hand side and therefore the idea was that that prevents electric current from going to the right and therefore uh, the only current which can go there is the spin current. So spins are injected here. Uh, there is an excess of spin density under the eject injection electron and then spin density diffuses both sides but we are interested in diffusion to the right. The conclusion of Johnson and Silsby was that if you have the other electrode, which is the other ferromagnetic electrode, which is schematically shown here, and then you measure the voltage between the top of this electrode and the ferromagnetic, uh, sorry, the normal metal line anywhere, then this voltage is given by their formula, the Johnson and Silsby formula, and this uh, voltage depends on only two things, the material parameter of the ferromagnet, the polarization of spin current inside the ferromagnet, and how much spin accumulation or how big or, or how much spin potential can you develop right under the contact here. Uh, so this formula was uh, seen as a great chance to measure spin polarization, for example. Uh, the propagation of charge and spin current in this diffusive regime are described by this very simple coupled equations. Uh, they are coupled by a term uh, that is proportional to the polarization of spin current in the ferromagnet. So in a normal metal, the equations for electric and spin current are uncoupled. In a ferromagnet, they are coupled. But it is very easy to use this equation to understand the Johnson and Silsby formula uh, because it indeed depends only on one assumption that there is no electric current in electrically floating part of the circuit where it cannot go. Uh, and the way you can understand it is you look at this term and you say, well, it looks just like an effective electromotive force that is added and produces its own contribution to the current. So uh, if since you know that there is no electric current, the left hand side has to be zero and then the gradient of electric potential of mu and the gradient of chemical potential mu s are related. And since you also know that if the thickness of this ferromagnet is large enough, the mu s at the top should decay to zero. Mu s always decays. Uh, we're not talking about any persistent uh, situations. And so uh, the total change of mu s between this point and this point is known and it gives you through the proportionality of gradients, the total change of electric potential, which is measured by the voltmeter. And that's why it doesn't depend on anything as long as the thickness here is large enough. So we started to think first about a situation where instead of a very thin ferromagnetic electrode, you have an extended uh, wide ferromagnetic electrode. Then as the spin current is injected here and propagates, the spin potential is decaying, of course. It is larger here, smaller, smaller, and smaller, and decays to zero. So you can ask, well, uh, if I put my electrode here or here, will I measure different voltages? And if I do measure a single voltage, if it doesn't depend on the position of the measurement point, just like uh, Johnson and Silsby told us, then uh, which chemical potential, well, which spin potential do I have to substitute? The one which observed here or the one that is observed here, or is there is some average which is appropriate for this situation? Uh, it was more interesting even because there were uh, computer uh, numerical simulations of this situation uh, for practical purposes. And what those numerical simulations showed is that the voltage here and here would be different. And the way so there was no doubt that the simulations were correct, but that looked as a puzzle because how can it be different here and here if you have uh, the equations on, from previous slide where all you needed is to know what is the spin potential here and it was definitely zero in all series we were talking about and then uh, if it was constant here and equal to zero, then the voltages should have been zero, you could prove it. So that, that was a puzzle. And the resolution of this puzzle was that uh, there is electric current in electrically uh, floating part of the circuit. Uh, 
This electric current is a special one. It does not go into this part and come out. It just goes inside of this floating electric part uh, and moves around the circle or around the closed path. Uh, this This current, you, you can prove a theorem that this current has to be there. And if you are interested in how mathematical you prove it, you can follow this. But physically, you can understand it this way. Because there is a gradient of mu s, and because there is this term, which can be con considered as an effective EMF in the equation for electric current, you have a situation where there is a concentrated elect electromotive force here on the boundary between normal and ferromagnetic uh, elements ferromagnetic parts of the circuit. And this EMF is pushing the current and then the circuit is completed here where there is no EMF because mu s here is very small or zero and mu s here is also very small and there is nothing to change from zero to zero. And so th this is like an electric circuit with EMF inserted here and this EMF pushes the current around it. The electric current that you see here is generated by the non-equilibrium situation and eventually powered by the source you use to inject pure spin current from the other part of the device. So you can uh, start thinking about it and instead of thinking about this uh, non-symmetric situation but more realistic, we decided to think about a situation which is uh, easier to analyze where you inject spin current at a point here and then there is an infinite uh, thin plane of normal metal and then there is another infinite film with a thickness TF of a ferromagnetic metal, and then the electric current here uh, is surging up from the injection point and then comes back and flows back through the normal uh, part of the device. So this was dubbed a spin fountain. Uh, we could calculate what are the voltages V1 and V2. Uh, V1 is measured between this point and here. V2 is measured between this point and here. And uh, you see that, number one, these voltages are different. So they are different from the Johnson and Silver result, which is shown here by the straight line. Uh, number two, both voltages depend, both voltages depend on the thickness of the ferromagnetic material. In particular, one thing that is a proof that there is a current is that Two voltages, V1 and V2, are different by the voltage drop between this point in the normal film and this point in the normal film as well. So if there is a differ difference between two voltages, that tells you that there should be a current flowing through the normal part. <coughs> uh, the second thing that we did with that was to study how far does the spin propagate along the boundary between normal and ferromagnetic metal. So uh, there is a solution in, in the paper and using this solution, you can plot the spin accumulation as a function of a distance from the injection point. What you see is that it starts falling down with a large exponent, but then this exponent changes to a slower decay. Uh, you find out that the second exponent, the decay here, depends on the thickness of the ferromagnetic layer on top of the normal one. Uh, and you find out that as you make the thickness of ferromagnetic uh, layer go to infinity, the decay uh, stops being exponential. So you can find out the, uh, you can find a formula for the second exponent and you find out that the uh, length of propagation is proportional to the thickness of the ferromagnetic element. <coughs> the explanation is like that. Suppose you start with a normal line, then the spin accumulation decays uh, with a spin diffusion length lambda. Uh, let's say you put a layer of other normal metal on top of the normal line. Then the spin current here can propagate along N, but it also, also can go away to N1. And that's why the spin diffusion length becomes smaller because there are more possibilities to have decay. So here you will have lambda prime and lambda prime will be smaller than lambda. Now you put a ferromagnetic layer on top. Usually the spin diffusion length in ferromagnet is very, very short. So you assume that there will be a lambda double prime that will be even shorter than in this situation. However, on top of that, there are those persistent, uh, <laughs> there are those uh, circular or uh, circular currents which are floating. And if the current is flowing, 
it starts here, it's originating here, but it has to come back. So it, it, it trans uh, traverses the NF interface twice, here and here. Whenever a current, electric current, traverses the FN interface, there is an injection of spin into M. And there is a change here. So the conclusion is that the spin accumulation, so, so it would produce some spin accumulation in the N layer. So the conclusion is that spin accumulation cannot decay separately from electric current decay. They decay together, and uh, if the electric current goes far away, then uh, the spin accumulation will not be uh, decaying as long as there is current for, uh, crossing the interface. So you can think, well, how far away does the electric current actually go? Uh, the electric current shoots from here, comes up, and then has to go down. So somehow that means that that is a rationale of why the distance of propagation, the characteristic distance of propagation, is related to the thickness of the ferromagnetic layer. It's because the upper surface of the ferromagnetic layer is like a lid, which you put on the fountain, and then it doesn't shoot too high up, and it returns faster. If there is no lid, when the TF goes to infinity, then you can calculate that the decay is uh, a power law. So formally speaking, uh, there is no, uh, uh, it's not a short range phenomenon. Uh, these are the conclusions from the first part. Uh, the second part is another example. <coughs> uh, spin current does not propagate very far. So whatever spintronic device you want to, to build, it has to be pretty small so that <coughs> you generate spin current and have time to use it. At a certain point, there were suggestions that you can propagate uh, spin current further or even uh, enhance it if you make a normal metal, if you make a normal metal element with a special shape, a directional shape in this case in the form of an arrow. So there was a, a statement that the spin current injected here will propagate here with a better probability than if you inject it from here and try to propagate it from right to left. And it looked uh, really uh, strange and uh, intriguing. Uh, so we decided to think about elements uh, which are elements of spintronic circuit uh, similar to the lumped elements of usual electronic circuits like resistors, capacitors, uh, and other lumped elements. Uh, what you would like to do is to consider uh, an element like that where you can inject uh, spin current and electric current and collect them on the other side. And just like you describe the resistor, with a resistance or conductance, describe it uh, by a few numbers uh, that will capture everything, the material properties and the shape of this element. Uh, now, the difference between the two situations is that unlike electric current, spin current decays. So the spin currents which enter on one side and the spin currents that uh, exit on the other side do not have to be the same. And therefore, uh, you have one electric current characterizing the situation, but you have, in addition, six spin currents on both sides that are characterizing the situation. Uh, as, just as well, you have one potential difference of electric potentials, but you also have six spin potentials. As a result, uh, instead of just one parameter, this uh, spintronic resistor is characterized by a matrix, which is a seven by seven matrix. And the question is uh, whether you can make any statements about the elements of this matrix uh, related to the original question. Uh, you describe it in a diffusive limit, just like I said in the beginning. Uh, you apply the boundary conditions, which are characteristic of boundaries between normal metals and strong ferromagnets. And then what you find out is that from those equations, you can prove a theorem that the matrix seven by seven is symmetric. So uh, here it's written as a six by six spin by spin matrix where spin potentials produce spin currents, uh, there are two uh, off-diagonal parts where electric potential produces spin current and vice versa, and there is a usual conductance for electric uh, currents. The, uh, the fact that it's symmetric uh, restricts the number of independent variables, but more importantly, when you go back to the original question, it proves that you can make an exact statement. Uh, if you inject spin here and measure spin current on the other side, uh, 
or inject spin here and measure spin current on the other, on, on that, on this, sorry, inject spin here and measure it here. So whether spin goes along the arrow or opposite to the arrow, the amount of transferred spin current will be the same. Somehow that was in contradiction to the papers we were trying to emulate, but then we realized that what those papers did is they compared the straight element with an arrow element. Uh, these two situations are not uh, related but by our theorem and there is no, uh, uh, nothing prevents this arrow shape to better conduct spin from left to right than the straight shape. It's just that this enhancement does not depend on the direction of the arrow. If this one enhances, the other one will enhance as well. And it is also true that maybe the circular shape of this bulge will enhance the spin propagation even larger. Um, due to the work of uh, anonymous referees, we had to make a lot of connections of our calculations with other uh, <coughs> restrictions on the matrices uh, and related to the circuit theory description of those contacts, but I probably don't have time to describe it, and I will just leave you with my second conclusion. Thank you very much. Okay, questions? So the symmetry persists just because of the diffusion equations or is there a more fundamental reason for the symmetry? Thank you. Uh, it was not a planted question. Uh, so <laughs> the, the symmetry that we are talking about is because of your diffusive equations. Uh, there are, there's other symmetry which, for example, is there because of Ansager equations and there is a difference between them. So Ansager would tell you that if you're talking about this off-diagonal elements and you're talking about the non-magnetic element, uh, non-magnetic physical element, then they would be of the opposite sign. Our symmetry tells us that they will be of the same sign. So it seems like they are in contradiction, except that if you're thinking about a non-magnetic metal, it's just a normal metal where both C and D are equal to zero. So this contradiction is uh, resolved by what, what has to actually is measured in a normal metal. Uh, if you are thinking about a situation with, with magnets, then in Saga relations, relations uh, they uh, connect an element with magnetization M1 and M2 to, those, to the element where M1 and M2 are reversed. So therefore, again, they are not in contradiction. Uh, the, that thing uh, depends, of course, on those assumptions, on diffusive assumptions and on the boundary conditions that we are using, so on what kind of ferromagnets do you have in your device. In the first part of your talk, you said that uh, the idea of this setup with spin injection current was to measure polarization. So is the bottom line that it does not measure polarization? The bottom line is that if you have a wide electrode, then you have to rethink how you extract polarization from. You can still, you can still extract it, it just requires more yes, work. Yes, so you, you would have to solve the problem, find how this current flows and know where your electrode is positioned. And, and if you look in, in the literature, you, you will see that it seems like there is a consistent difference between what was measured with wide electrodes and other methods. So maybe it's because. I have a question about the, the interface between the ferromagnet and the normal metals. I think in the original uh, Johnson Zilsby, they have a parameter they could not uh, quantify, an arbitrary pr parameter for the spin diffusion across that interface. And so I wondered, I didn't quite understand how you included that in uh, the model. Here, here we assume that it's an, uh, transparent in, oops, the wrong direction. So I have a slide here, here, here. So it assumes that uh, the interface is transparent, so chemical potentials are. Yeah, but the interface is not transparent. I mean, even in so Johnson-Silsby experiments, I think the interface, let's say, for thermal aluminum was 10% transparent. 
and then typically in most uh, simple ferromagnets that you were referring to and simple things like copper, the transparency is typically 25% or 50%. Yeah, and, and that could be also ah. would be depend on the direction of the spin current. And, and moreover, flow. I, I will even enhance your and question. And your conclusions would be wrong. <laughs> I, I enhance your question because there are lots of experiments where you have a where you have a tunnel barrier be between the ferromagnet, and so then it's amplified. And I, mm, I'm working on that. No answer right now. <laughs> More questions? If we have time. Uh, the same speaker and the session is over.